currently at this moment in history, there is a war that is happening between Russia and Ukraine. We are getting more involved. We're just coming through a pandemic which created a great amount of fear and we're worried about the future economy of our country. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one can say, look, this is something new. It was here already, long ago. It was here before our time. No one remembers the former generation. There's something very powerful in understanding that the war that you're waging internally is the same war that thousands and thousands and thousands of Christians have waged before you. Remembering I have the inability to cast a new fear onto God helps remove isolation and that fosters confidence moving forward. Well, good Monday morning, beautiful soul. You are listening to Things I Learned on Sunday, a recalling of insights harvested through conversation, observation, and the example of others. Now, the purpose of this podcast is that you would share in the powerful impact of these insights along with me while you begin your day and hopefully nourish your soul to start your week off right. Welcome. So here at the beginning of the year, I took Jo Lee and supported her along with Papa Bob and Mama Jo as she competed in Run for the Ranch. We're here at Jamestown. It's near Rogersville. Jo Lee is getting ready to run the Run for the Ranch half marathon. She did this last year and it took her two hours and one minute. She got the best time in her age division and she's trying to beat two hours today. Are you ready? So in the last couple of half marathons, this has been kind of the elusive goal that we've both been rooting for. I got to thinking while she was running that our running styles are very different. And like many things in my life, Joe Lee will start to do something and lead by example. And I observe her and then eventually I come around to doing the same thing. I never thought I would run. But because of my wife starting to run early in our marriage, actually even before we were married, I began running years later. So now I will run about every other day, about three miles a day. Well, my wife, she's running half marathons and marathons. And I've never seen myself having a desire to, to run like a marathon. Now, Number one, I couldn't do it right now. I mean, let's get really clear about that. I'm not physically in that kind of shape. But number two, I kind of asked myself why. And there's a big difference between how Joe Lee runs and how I run. Whenever we run together, I noticed I'm slowing down. But here's the thing. Joe Lee is able to run 26.2 miles running at that speed, which I would not be able to do. Whenever I run... I just want to get there. 90% of the time, I don't run a three mile run and at some point don't wish I was not running. Like I just want to get this thing over with and, and get the health benefits and get the feeling that I feel after the run is over. Now she runs because it puts her into this very peaceful state, this peaceful zone. And she actually enjoys the process of running. So she has this ability to endure for long periods of time. One of my favorite scriptures, possibly my favorite scripture, is Hebrews 12, 1 and 1 through 3 says, Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. I kind of look at the differences between how Joe Lee and I run as to how different 
Christians try to run the Christian race. And in the end of verse two, at the end of verse one, where it says, let us run with perseverance, the race marked out for us. I feel like Joe Lee in this metaphor is the Christian who knows that it's a long race and who knows that they are going to stumble at times, who knows that they are not always going to run perfectly. So they just keep putting one foot in front of the other towards God, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, and they persevere and they end up getting there. I think myself in this metaphor is the kind of Christian, maybe when they're baptized, like they're, there's this huge fire, like we're on fire to live our lives for God. And so we think we can run at 100 miles an hour, but then the first time we stumble or when we start to slow down or the flame maybe isn't as strong, we get really discouraged. And many people stop after the first mile as opposed to understanding this is a race and we have to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, who is the perfecter of our faith, meaning we're not going to do it perfectly. We focus on him so that we understand we're not perfect and that requires us to focus on him, to make our faith perfect when we are not. And so Jolie had a great run. If you want to know her time, she has about seven minutes now to make it in under two hours. This is going to be really close. Her time, 203 again, so close. She still finished first in her age division for the half marathon. We both, I am so invested in this because I know how important it is to her. She has another half marathon coming up. She will get there. It's just a question of when. And I can promise you that will be in this podcast when that day comes. And this brings me to the things that I learned on Sunday. The first thing that I learned on Sunday comes from C4C class. Doug had the lesson this Sunday entitled New and Old Fears, and he used a story because we're creating these lessons from scratch. It's the Thriving in the 2020s series, because right now we're facing this war. There's a war in Ukraine right now where Russia has invaded. We've just come through a pandemic. The economic future of the U.S. is is unclear And so we're talking about how there are current fears that technically are new fears, specifically things that haven't happened, but they are also fundamentally fears. The place that the fear resonates from is something that has resonated since the dawn of time. Whenever Christians were putting their faith in Jesus 500 years ago, they were putting faith in him and casting their fears on him just like we are today, even though the circumstances might be different, the basic fundamental fears themselves are the same. So we wanted to create a lesson on this and talk about some of the challenges of today. Doug came up with a scripture that I really didn't see coming in conjunction with this topic, but it's the parable of the talents. We have a man who was given five talents We have a man who was given two talents, and we have a man that was given one talent. And so we know that the guy who had five went out, was able to invest, made five more. The guy that made two went out, was able to invest, made two more. But the guy who had one buried that talent. And it's in Matthew 25, 19 that we see the product, the outcome for each man of their actions. Verse 19 says, After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I've gained five more. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I've gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. From five bag to two, five bags to two bags, 
multiplied by two, the exact same outcome, exact same statement is made in scripture. Then we go to verse 24. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you were a hard man, harvesting where you've not sown and gathering where you've not scattered seed. So I was afraid. I went out and I hid your gold in the ground. See, here's what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I've not sown and I gather where I've not scattered seed. Then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take this bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags for whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have even what they have will be taken from them and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Okay, so I just got through saying that this lesson was on both new and old fears. And it didn't make the connection with me until Doug started to explain his point. If you look at verse 25, the man who was given the one talent explains he was afraid and he went out and hid the gold in the ground. So it gives the motivation behind It gives the reasoning behind why the one man didn't invest the money and just hid it in the ground. It was out of fear. So he explains to the master why he hid the gold in the ground. And if you look at the master's reply to this, he's not having it. The fact that the man was afraid to the master, this was an unworthy excuse as to why he had not made anything of that opportunity. And so I didn't, I hadn't really ever looked at that this way, that there was an emphasis that it was fear that motivated this man to do nothing. So it's not maybe just that he was lazy. He wasn't willing to take risk, any kind of risk, out of fear. He was given very little. So the risk fairly small, especially considering one guy was given five times as much as him, but he doesn't do anything with it out of fear. Ephesians 5, 15 in the first part of 16, it says, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity. And it made me realize that we are commanded to make the most of the opportunities in front of us. And then in parallel with this Matthew 25 parable, the idea that we are afraid is an unworthy excuse as a reason for not following Ephesians 5, 15, and 16, making the most of every opportunity. Doug made the point that fear can freeze you and keep you from doing just about anything if you're afraid enough. And intuitively or experientially, you know this to be the truth, right? That you've had things in your life that you were just afraid enough. And maybe we don't call it fear. Maybe we call it anxiety. Maybe we call it stress. But fundamentally, these are the same flavor of fear. We don't act. And so the thing that I really learned on Sunday was, is that my fear, when I look at my life, what I am afraid to do, it's an unworthy excuse as a reason for lack of maximizing the opportunities in front of me. And so then I look, what opportunities have I not maximized? Have I not squeezed the juice out of? Because there is some kind of fear, fear of failure, fear of not being enough, um, maybe even fear of what the success might bring. What are the opportunities I am not maximizing out of fear? And that's the same question I will ask you. Where are there opportunities in front of you right now that you are not taking advantage of or you're not maximizing just because you're afraid. Because according to this parable, fear is an unworthy excuse not to maximize those opportunities. And we want to look for opportunities to bring people into the kingdom. So fear of insignificance, fear of unworthiness, fear of not being good enough is also not a good reason 
to not maximize opportunities to bring those into God's house. This brings me to the second thing that I learned on Sunday, learning forgiveness by respecting grace. This comes from Philip's lesson on Sunday. Matthew chapter 18, 21 through 35 is the text. This is Peter coming to Jesus and asking Jesus, how many times should I forgive my brother or sister? And he says up to seven times. And so Jesus's replies in verse 22, he says, I tell you not seven times, but 70 times seven. And then he tells a story about a servant who went before his master who had great debt and the master was going to throw him in prison. The servant begs at his feet saying, just give him time. He will repay. And the master has pity on the servant. But that's not where the story ends. If you look at verse 27, it says the servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. So nothing in comparison to what he owed his master. So what does he do? Does he say, I've been forgiven and I am so thankful, so I'm going to forgive you as well? No, he grabs the guy and he starts choking him, saying, pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged, be patient with me and I will pay it back. Does that sound familiar? But he refused and said he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. So when another servant who was observing both situations saw what had happened, they were outraged. They went and told their master everything that had happened. So then here, the master gets to hear what his servant did to someone who owed him money. The master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. You know, in some circles, Christianity gets a really bad name that, that you know, Christianity can be judgmental. Christians can be filled with hate. But one thing that you don't see, and I don't think that people understand, is that the standards for forgiveness, the standards of letting go in Christianity, even though Christians do not follow the standard perfectly, the standards are higher than you're going to find anywhere else. And I know that I've had struggles letting go and forgiving people that I feel like have, have truly wronged me, where I feel like I have been treated unjustly. And I can talk to a mentor and have many times about the frustration of needing to forgive someone who has wronged me and having anger or frustration about the person. And this mentor, he will remind me whenever I say this person does not deserve to be forgiven. He will say, well, Christ didn't deserve to die a death on the cross. And he did that for you. And, and you know what? I have found there's just no rebuttal to that answer. And that's really what's being said here. You see, in verse 27, it says the servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt and let him go. And it's with that knowledge that this servant goes and does not forgive his fellow servant. And see, that's the real problem here. It's when you've been forgiven a debt that you can never repay, but then you don't forgive others. It's as if you never really understood the grace and the forgiveness to begin with. And I know whenever my mentor has said to me, well, Christ forgave you, it is a lack of understanding of God's grace that makes it challenging to be able to forgive other people. Because whenever he says that, and I really think about what Christ endured in that moment, in that moment, forgiveness comes much easier. So what I learned on Sunday, my ability to forgive, it's a forthright reflection of my ability to respect grace 
in Christ's sacrifice for me. So my the ability, the capability that I have to forgive someone else, it is a direct consequence. It is a forthright or direct reflection of the other ability that I have, and that is to respect grace. Respect the fact that I didn't do anything to deserve it in Christ's sacrifice for me. My ability to forgive is a forthright reflection of my ability to respect grace in Christ's sacrifice for me. And this brings me to the third thing that I learned on Sunday. The third thing that I learned on Sunday comes from replay. No new fears are cast on God. So this last Sunday night, we had the opportunity to go to two of our newer members at Sunset's home, Beth and David, their son Owen is in the college ministry. And so they invited us after church Sunday night to have an an awesome meal in their beautiful home and get to know them a little bit better and have a biblical discussion together. And so in that discussion, we were talking about class Sunday morning. We were talking about this concept of there not really being any new fears. Really, there not being anything new. And this being something that Solomon saw on his journey to find fulfillment. Ecclesiastes 1, 8 says, All things are wearisome, more than one can say. The eye never has enough of seeing, nor the ear its fill of hearing. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one can say, look, this is something new. It was here already, long ago. It was here before our time. No one remembers the former generations, and even those yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow them. So currently at this moment in history, there is a war that is happening between Russia and Ukraine. And at this moment, we are getting more involved in this war. We're just coming through a pandemic in the U.S., which created a great amount of fear. And we're worried about the future economy of our country. And so, in having this discussion Sunday morning, we talked about Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and the fact that there's real no new fears under the sun. And so, Sunday night, I asked the question, how does it make you feel knowing this idea that the fears that you have felt are fears that have been felt over and over again over the years, over thousands of years. 1 Peter 5, 5 through 7, if you really look in the middle of verse 5 there, it said, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves. And then in verse 7, it says, cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. And Julianne said something that really resonated with me in class on Sunday morning This idea that for thousands of years, fundamentally, the things that I'm stressed about, the things that I am anxious about, the things that I am afraid of, these are things that the fundamental feeling that I have has been felt over and over and over again. And that also means, according to 1 Peter chapter 5, this idea of casting all our anxieties on him because he cares for us, that Christians for the longest time have been casting anxieties and fears on God, and he has been doing that for a very, very long time for millions and millions of people. And like Julianne, it made me feel very confident to know that I'm not the only one. Like, just the knowledge that Christians have fundamentally felt the same fears I'm feeling, even though there's different things going on in the world right now, it kind of takes away isolation. And Satan utilizes isolation to continue bringing us down a spiral. So for me, it was more of a reminder And this is the third thing that I learned on Sunday. Remembering I have the inability to cast a new fear 
onto God, helps remove isolation, and that fosters confidence moving forward. There's something very powerful in understanding that the war that you're waging internally is the same war that thousands and thousands and thousands of Christians have waged before you, and that they are making the decision to cast their anxieties on God, that they have done that over and over again, just like you are choosing to do. Remembering I have the inability to cast a new fear onto God helps remove isolation and foster confidence to move forward. That is it. Thank you so much for joining me this week. If you have not already, please like and subscribe, even consider commenting on this video so we, you and I, can grow this platform outside these four digital walls. Whatever you do, though, make it a great day today and make it a great week by serving and allowing your bright light to be seen all week. And as the good book says, they will know we are Christians by our love. Until next time, 